So good morning, everyone. Good morning. I've always loved the wonder and majesty of a rainbow. So, and I think there's multiple lessons that we can learn from them. So we're going to go a few different places today as we look at different rainbows. Of course, you can't talk about rainbows without starting in Genesis, with the beginning of rainbows. So Genesis 9 8, then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you, and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you. The birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is a sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you, and every living creature that is with you. For all successive generations, I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So from that scripture, we can deduce that the pre-flood earth was a very different place since they didn't have rainbows. So imagining that world can be really fascinating. I've read a bunch of books about people that have tried to piece together from the little clues we have in geology and in scripture what it might have been like. So a lot of Christian scientists believe that they found evidence even of floating islands and other things that today we'd find amazing. Today people are making their own floating community islands that can float to where they can generate the best uh, energy from the sun and from the ocean beneath them. But back then, these floating islands would have been completely natural. The trees would have kind of held them together. I just think it's fascinating to think of what that world would have been like because it sounds like it was a pretty different place than we have today. So think about Noah and his family. They were saved from the destruction of that first earth on the ark. But when they came out of it, it's a completely different world, and probably entering an ice age. If you pass through uh, Kentucky, I highly recommend that ark experience that just got finished there. Seeing the size of the ark and walking around what it might have been like is truly amazing. The decks and the timber of how it could have been constructed with the technology we know that they had biblically back then seeing their thoughts on possible food storage and how you could have kept food for that amount of time. <clears throat> how animals could have been transported and cared for. Uh, they've got ideas on how they could have set up the feeding so they wouldn't have to feed them every day. It would just keep auto-feeding them. Uh, how the waste kind of would have dropped down and then how they could have shoveled it out and had it go through. It's just amazing all the thought they put into how you would have made this work for that period of time. So it's estimated Noah spent about 75 years building the ark and then more equipping it and gathering food before God brought the animals to him and the flood began. It's estimated that his family was probably on the ark just over a year. And then he gets off it to that changed world. Most likely a mini ice age just starting as a result of all the massive changes to the earth and everything they knew they knew before has changed. So while they're coming to terms with all of those changes, God gives them a rainbow as a reminder of the covenant that he would never flood the whole earth again. So I'm going to try and keep building a list here with different lessons that we can learn from rainbows, and the first of which is that it's a reminder of the covenant to not flood the earth again. But thinking back to the scripture uh, that I was just reading, it said there was a covenant between God and all living flesh, human and animal, that he would never flood the whole earth again. So after I read that passage multiple times, I started thinking, since this applies to animals as well, can animals actually appreciate or see a rainbow? So I started doing some looking. The full electric spectrum runs from these short waves uh, on the left there called gamma waves, all the way over to radio waves there on the right. And just in the middle there between the ultraviolet and the infrared is the visible light spectrum. What most average people can see, from the purple all the way off to the red. So if we look at our eye, light first hits our cornea, and this bends light to the pupil, which controls how much light passes through. Then it focuses that light onto the lens, which then in turn focuses it back to the retina. The retina then has sensitive cells called rods, and cones, which send information to ganglion cells, who in turn send the information to the optic nerve, who sends it onto our brain. No 
quizzes or tests later on this. <laughs> so rods uh, that I mentioned give us our perception of light, dark, and peripheral vision. Anybody read a Louis Lamour novel? Okay. Louis Lamour, a lot of times, when they've got somebody on watch, they'll talk about the fact that only greenhorns look at, at the fire while they're on watch. Because when you see that bright light, it destroys your peripheral vision. So I, I found this in many of his books. They always talk about the fact that they always face away from the fire so it doesn't destroy their peripheral vision. So those rods are what they actually figured out is doing that. Uh, it gives you your peripheral vision, and when you get too much light, you lose your peripheral. But uh, it's also kind of interesting that your peripheral doesn't come in color. Then the color is coming from cones. And that's only the color, not the peripheral. And people, average people, have three uh, cones that let us see color. And the uh, blue, the green, and that red spectrum there, different wavelengths. And it's what we call the visible light spectrum. Now dogs, on the other hand, have only two cones. So they can't see the difference between red and green. They only would see a blue to green rainbow. Butterflies have an extra cone, so unlike us, they see into the ultraviolet range, as well as the visible spectrum that we can see. So a butterfly is going to see a bigger rainbow than we do. The mantis strip has 12 cones, so they see well into the ultraviolet. Again, much larger rainbow than we do. It's kind of interesting. So to review, the light spectrum is vast, but our eyes can only see a limited spectrum due to the three cones we have. We do know, though, that a rainbow goes beyond what we can see, uh, so those animals can sometimes see less than we do or greater than we do. Uh, but the reason that we know that rainbows go further is because if you take a picture of a rainbow in black and white, you can see that it's much wider, and that's because black and white photography captures the ultraviolet besides the visible. I don't know why many people like to take a black and white photograph of a rainbow because they don't see much of it, but you do see it wider. So it does answer that animals can't see rainbows, it's just not the same way we do, due to the different kinds of cones. We don't know if animals really can appreciate it, but since God said it's a reminder of the covenant between God and every living creature, it does make sense that animals can see them. Sir Isaac Newton labeled seven distinct colors of the visible spectrum. Anybody want to guess why seven? Yeah. That's a perfect number, he was a Christian. Seven days of creation and most many other sevens. So, you know, a normal rainbow drops, goes, you know, lightly to, from one color to the next to the next. But he decided he could isolate it into seven different names and seven primary colors there. Uh, he believed that as a scientist, a scientist's job was to figure out how God did all the wonderful things that he did. Today, most scientists seem to be anti Christian, but back then, Science was discovering how God did all the wonderful things that he did. Very different take than today. So this is some performance art in the UK, I believe it was the UK, where they kind of do submit and then project colors onto it. You can see it's a kind of very artificial rainbow because all those colors are just those seven bands instead of actually gradually going one to the next. So the rainbow is produced by going through a raindrop, and it's like a prism splitting the white light out from the sun into bands of those distinct color frequencies. And notice how that interior raindrop wall acts like a mirror reflecting it back out a different direction. Did you know, though, that a rainbow is a personal experience? Each rainbow is perceived depending on where the raindrops are, the angle of the sunlight to the rain, and your position relative to the sun and rain. Even if you're standing next to someone, they will not see the same rainbow you do because it's very distinct on the angle. If you take a picture, then everybody can see the lens exact position. But even standing next to somebody, they will not see the exact same rainbow you do. Which kind of gives a different emphasis to this verse. Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. The rainbow that you see is for you alone. In 1967, Rene Descartes decided to study the properties of rainbows, and he did a ton of tests. Uh, but one of the more interesting things that he found was that the lower the sun is to the horizon, the larger the arch of the rainbow. Right at sunset, we see a full semicircle of the rainbow with the top of the arc 32 degrees above the horizon. 
But the higher the sun is in the sky, the smaller the arch of the rainbow. So this is an example of a higher arc with the sun very low in the sky versus a very low rainbow with the sun high in the sky. When I was thinking about this, I realized I don't think I've ever seen a rainbow that was that low. So I think I always see rainbows near sunrise and sunset. Because I don't think I've ever seen one with this low arch. And we find that we're seeing only one color from each raindrop. So when you're looking at a rainbow, we're seeing the refracted light contributed from many raindrops. And the drops lower in the sky give us the blue and green, and higher in the sky we get the red and yellow. The normal rainbow we see is produced by one internal reflection of the sunlight, sunlight rays. When you see a rainbow, the sun is behind you, and the rain is either ahead of you or right on you. Of course, it doesn't have to be rain. It can be any source of water, like a waterfall. Uh, when my family visited Niagara Falls, there's rainbows all over the place, wherever the mist is. Really beautiful. But you can see in this picture where the spray ends, so does the rainbow. So for the normal base rainbow, our application is, it's a reminder of the covenant to not flood the earth again. The covenant also applies to animals, not just mankind. It's an individual covenant with you and God. And each rainbow is only seen by a specific individual. So then moving on from a normal rainbow, there's a moonbow. And a moonbow is when a rainbow is caused by the sun first reflecting off the moon. And as you might guess, they can be hard to see due to the much lower lighting conditions. I've never seen one. But if we look at Psalms 89, uh, 35b and 37, it says, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon. And the witness in the sky is faithful. So even the moon can bear witness to God's covenants, just like the rainbow. The moonbow ends up bearing witness to two covenants then, the one not to flood the earth again, and the Davidic uh, promise. Then we've got a fogbow. A fogbow is a rainbow caused by water droplets in fog. And since the droplets of water in the fog are extremely small, you don't get much color out of it. This reminds us that we're like fog. As in uh, Scripture, James 4, 13-15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just like vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. We need to remember that we never know what tomorrow will bring. Then we've got a red rainbow. And there's many proverbs that are related to rainbows, but they all seem to be connected to what's called a red rainbow. The red rainbow is formed at sunrise and sunset. The sun's rays travel along paths through the lower atmosphere, where they're scattered by air molecules and dust. Short wavelength blues and greens are scattered more strongly, leaving the remaining transmitted light proportionally richer in reds and yellows. And the result is red rainbows. Now back to the proverbs. Rainbow at night, shepherds delight. Rainbow in morning, shepherds take warning. Related to that one, one I've heard more often, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in morning, sailor take warning. Then there's, if there be a rainbow in the eve, it will rain and leave, but if there be a rainbow in the morrow, it will neither lend or borrow. Rainbow to windward, foul fall the day. Rainbow to leeward, damp runs away. But did you know they're also biblical? Uh, Jesus mentioned it in Matthew 16, 1 through 4. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show him a sign from heaven. But when he replied to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So from this we learn, don't test God and Jesus and ask for signs. So if you look at this one, you can kind of see a faint double rainbow uh, off the right side of the main rainbow. But back to the Proverbs, they're actually logical. When you remember that to see a rainbow, rain must be falling in part of the sky, and the sun must be shining in the other part of the sky. So to see a rainbow or red sky, 
a person has to be facing the rain and have the sun at your back. When we see a rainbow at night, we're facing east and towards the rain shower. When we see a morning rainbow, we're facing west and towards the rain shower. And in the middle latitudes, clouds and wind mostly travel west to east, so rain in the west or a morning rainbow would eventually reach us. So, I mentioned that you can see a faint double rainbow in that red one. So, moving on to double rainbows. They're very pretty and amazing. I've seen a few of them here and there. But you'll notice if you, when you see a double rainbow, the second rainbow is always more faint. And what I didn't always uh, notice when I was looking at them, the colors are reversed on the second rainbow. A secondary rainbow arises from two internal reflections with the rays exiting the drop at an angle of 50 degrees rather than 42 degrees for the red primary rainbow. Blue light emerges at an even larger angle of 53 degrees, and this effect produces a secondary rainbow with reverse colors compared to the normal primary rainbow. And since the secondary rainbow reflects in the raindrop twice, as you see in that upper raindrop, it's not as bright because it loses more of the color. And I believe the colors being reversed tells us sometimes God will lead us to change our direction. So I kind of condensed this, but in Acts 8, we read about Philip. So when, the word, so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Change of direction number one. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join in this chariot. Second change of direction. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. Third change of direction. A major change of direction that last time. But three times in this passage, not because of anything Philip did wrong, but because God needed him somewhere, we saw God change Philip's direction. So we need to be open to God changing our direction to fit his needs. Sometimes when something happens, a flat tire or something, maybe that's because he needs us to be talking to somebody specific uh, that comes to change our tire or what have you. He might need us somewhere different. So remember when things happen, God may be changing our direction for his needs. Then we've got the twin rainbow. And I wish I'd seen this one, but I've never seen this one. So this is a rainbow, that, and this one's double, but it's a rainbow that appears to split from the base, and you have two different versions, two different arcs. This is very rare. I was talking about Rene Descartes earlier. Him and most other scientists assume the raindrops are spherical. And while this can explain a rainbow and even a double rainbow, it does not explain a twin rainbow. So scientists for a long time could not understand how a twin rainbow actually exists. But in 2011, not very long ago, scientists figured out that actual raindrops flatten as they fall due to air resistance. And the flattening is more prominent on the bottom than the top. And this ends up making the raindrops look like hamburgers, so they call them burgeroids. <laughs> so if you look, if you think of a normal hamburger, the bottom's a lot more flat than the top, so this is kind of what you end up with. So a twin rainbow ends up when two rain showers of different sized raindrops combine. Each set of raindrops produces a slightly different angled rainbow, which gives us that twin form. And we know in the church that we all come from the same base. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. You're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, being the cornerstone, one base. So Jesus is our cornerstone. And though our personal arc and journey may be different, we know that we start on that same base. 
and our art may be different because we all have slightly different journeys through life, probably because of the different gifts and jobs that we have. Romans 12, 6 through 8, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Each of us having a different job to do, we are still all moving in one purpose. Philippians 2, 2b, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. But within that purpose, we can still have those different marks from the same base. So to sum up, Different Christians will have different journeys through life, even while we're united in one purpose and starting from that one cornerstone. Then we've got a sudden smile rainbow. Anybody ever seen this one? It's another one I've never seen. I'd love to. Rainbows are rarely seen in winter since you need rain, and in winter we'd have snow. But if the temperature is just right, you can get ice crystals to form instead of snow, and that's when you get a sun smile, an upside-down rainbow. And if we check out Hebrews 11, 1 through 2 and 6, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it men of old gained approval, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So we find faith is how we get approval from God or a smile. Then we've got the supernumerary or stacker rainbow one that I haven't quite seen, but they're not supposed to be that rare. But this is what happens when uh, colors are separated out, caused by some of the rays of the sun canceling each other out through what's called destructive interference. And it causes color bands to be erased in narrow bands. So sometimes we have to make sure that we don't interfere with other Christians that aren't part of our own church or movement. In Luke 9, 49 and 50, we find John answered and said, Master, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name. And we try to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. So we have to make sure that we don't interfere with other Christians that aren't part of our own group. Of course, we'll know true Christians by their actions. All the different varieties of rainbows are awe inspiring. But did you know? We don't see a full rainbow, at least not here on Earth. So if I expand out that chart that I showed earlier, a rainbow would be a full circle, but the ground interrupts the arc. The only time that you can see the full beauty and wonder of a rainbow is from a much higher vantage point. So what we see is awe-inspiring, but what God sees from his vantage is even more so. This one kind of looks complete, but it's only due to a reflection on the water, so not quite a full circle rainbow. This one gets rather close uh, from the waterfall. And this one, uh, from a high vantage point, is really close, but we don't quite see it complete on the bottom. But then this one, shot from an airplane, is complete. And bonus, it's a double. So it's kind of a reminder that we don't have the full picture. Sometimes we can seem so small and our issues so large. As this individual, we can only see what's in front of us, not the full picture or full, full rainbow, as God can. During times of trial, it can seem like life is dead, issues are insurmountable. But God sees us in a different light, since he's got the whole picture. Psalms 40, 1 through 3a. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth and a song of praise to our God. And then uh, Philippians 4, B and 7. The Lord is near, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So remember that we can't see the full picture like God can, but we can trust in God that everything's coming together. So I wanted to bring up one more thing that I learned about rainbows while I was researching the sermon. I found out that a rainbow is more than just a reminder of God's covenant. 
Ezekiel 128 says, As the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. So to run down the different lessons, I think we can draw from rainbows. It's a reminder of the covenant to not flood the earth again. This covenant applies to animals, not just men. This is an individual covenant with you and God. Each rainbow is only seen by a specific individual. The moon can be witness to God's covenants, just like the rainbow. So moon bow is bearing witness to two covenants. We never know what tomorrow may bring. Do not test God and Jesus and ask for signs. We need to be open to God changing our direction to fit his needs. Different Christians will have different journeys through life, even if one purpose. Faith is how we get approval from God. We have to make sure that we don't interfere with other Christians that are not part of our own group. We can't see the full picture like God can. And the appearance of a rainbow is like the appearance of the glory of the Lord. So when I started, I asked if an animal can grasp the full beauty of a rainbow. But perhaps the better question is, do we grasp and remember that the rainbow, besides a reminder of the covenant God has with us, is also the closest thing we can see today to God's radiance? Have you ever fallen on your face when you saw a rainbow? Or at least given thanks to God. 